All right. Good evening, everybody. Let's all stand together. Page 136. 136. Angels we have heard on high. So, two requests tonight. Number one, put a smile on your face. Some of you look like you've been into the pickle jar way too much. <laughs> all right. Once we get a smile, then sing loud. First and last. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plain, and the mountains in reply echo back their joyous strains. Good to see you here. Glad that you're here. And um, let me just go over the prayer list and we'll highlight a few of the, of the prayer concerns. Um, do be praying for Frank. I saw Frank today. He's awful weak, but he was, he was conscious. He recognized me. And uh, I, I talked to him. I couldn't hardly hear him. He was just really quiet. And I told him, I said, I said, I love you, Frank. The people at church love you. They're praying for you. And he said, so uh, he was conscious, but he's just an uh, awful, awful week. So keep Frank in your prayers. Continue to pray for Miss Lois. She is awful weak too. And, and just, uh, we don't know how long the Lord's going to let us have them. And, and we just need to pray that God's perfect will will be done. Uh, how's Tracy's cousin, Starla, doing, Barb? Is she? Good. Okay, so keep Starla, Tracy's cousin. Um, I, last week I learned that uh, Frank Robbins had pancreatitis. I believe he's home now, but uh, pray for, for Frank and Karen. Uh, I think that's all the new ones. Uh, you, are there any requests that you'd like us to remember tonight? Anyone? Barb? Okay, so Tom starts his radiation tomorrow. Cody. All right, keep Sequoia in your prayers. Any other needs tonight? We've got a handsome young man with a microphone if, for the people at home. Miss Sunny has one. I just want to make a request that we all remember all the traveling missionaries and traveling pastors and family members that maybe might not get to see them as much as they'd like. Right. Uh, so their hopefully their holidays will be safe and and full of love. Amen. Pray for our church family too, those that will be traveling, that God will give traveling mercy. All right. Any other needs? Yes, sir. Uh, there's a lady in New Orleans. Her name 
There's a microphone right there. We can hear you, but at home they get mad if they don't hear us. Oh, that's okay. Uh, there's a lady in Moreland. Her name is Jerry Mole, and she's been battling cancer, and she's down to her very last days, and uh, she's lived a great life, and you know, and just done everything right, and just been as good a soul as you could ask for. So, just pray for her that God pray will give her, her an easy. Yeah, absolutely. Did you say the last name's Mole? Yeah, M U L L. Yep. Okay. Mull, okay. All right. Jerry Mull, pray for her. It's hard for us, but it's good for them. They get to go home. So pray for Jerry. Any other needs? Brother Dave, just a second. There's a fast young man coming. I talked to Ed Wood a couple days ago, and he's 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 fine. He's got this... Um, brain issue and it's there's no cure for it so he's just doing what he's doing and waiting for it to go home so All right it's it's he said he's the last six months he's been in and out of the hospital 20 times so oh, wow anyway keeping on on the prayers all right keep danny span in your prayers he's been awful weak keep danny remember any other needs go ahead robert just a second there's a fast young man We need to pray for Lois while she's gone. Uh, they took her down to Lander Sunday, and she'd be gone there thinking until March. And this is going back to her daughter in Ohio? Uh, apparently sometime late this week. Okay. They're not sure of exactly when. All right. <laughs> okay, pray for Lois Simpson. She'll be traveling back to Ohio to be with her daughter. I have a young man here that has a prayer request. I'm just thankful for you guys praying for us when my grandson died. And um, when it happened, we were really, really. Pray for that family. Pray for those boys. Amen. Any other needs? Brother Marvin, would you ask the Lord to remember as many diseases as you can? And <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we bow before you, and we thank you again for the opportunity to be here in church together midweek. Lord, we just pray that uh, we would enjoy the fellowship, not as many as on Sunday, but uh, Lord, we do love you, and we do love to come to church and come together. Lord, this prayer time, I just ask that you uh, look at our prayer list and we pray for our pastors, uh, pray for Pastor Tony and Karen and and uh, Caleb and McKenna. Lord, as they're our leaders, we just ask that you just put a special uh, covering over them during this holiday season. There's extra duties going on right now, and we just pray that they can stay healthy and no colds and no sickness. We thank you for the job they do here to help us in our ministry. Lord, we go through the list. We think of Brad Schaefer and Lori Olson. and She was going to have tests in Colorado. I don't know the results of that, if that went all right. And pray for Tommy Sullivan and Earl Jackson, Felina's uh, brother-in-law, and Danny Spann. We just thank you, Carolyn. Pray for healing there. Yes, Father. Ed Wood is... is uh, been mentioned and pray for pastor and lois lord i just i don't know exactly if others feel that way but i don't know exactly what to ask for them other than your guidance for pastor and and a happiness for lois for every day that we have i don't yes. know how that can happen but i just pray your care there your special watch over them pray for jim graham and Rhonda nelson's uh brother and pastor graves uh pray for him and McKenna and Pastor Carl and his breathing and uh, Vendela Henthorne, pray for her and Tad and uh, Lord just watch over them for Tony Andrine and Frank Walker and for Starla 
for Frank Robbins, Lord, and we also pray for someone to be able to fill into his church up there. He's got responsibilities. And yes. I just yes. ask for that special need there. Pray for Tracy's cousin and, and uh, pray for the traveling that goes on these next two weeks uh, for church people especially and those that are not Christians. We ask that you just watch over them and give us all safety. And uh, Lord, we ask for pray for Jerry Mall there in Worland. And uh, we just ask that they uh, would have peace and that they would know you and draw closer to you. And then, Lord, we pray for uh, Jerusalem. Lord, we pray for Israel. Yes, and, Lord. And uh, people that don't know your word, just I don't see how they just don't pray right. And uh, so I pray for strength for Israel and guidance and protection from them. Yes, Lord. Even though they've lost some men just yesterday and today. But uh, I pray for those in Gaza uh, not to be uh, against those that are in the way of, of war, but somehow that has to end. They have to get the guy they want. So I pray that it would happen fast. And I think of also our uh, Ukraine proposition. They've been over asking our country for money. And those of us that still make money here, Lord, we wonder how we can just keep affording stuff. And, yes, uh, Lord. So ease our mind and help us not to be discouraged too. Anyway, Lord, I pray now for our church and the Christmas season. We're, we're planning a, a program Sunday night. We have uh, an outdoor ha going to the Pioneer Home. We just pray that that goes well and that would just be a witness, Lord Jesus, for for you outside our church. And then, Lord, we just ask that the messages that we have are just really calling us to be sound Christians and to be not movable to what we hear and believe. Help us to hold fast and not deviate from that. Lord, I ask you to just be with us this evening and uh, help us to understand what Pastor brings to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, the teens are at Pastor Caleb and McKenna's house. They're having their Christmas party but the young people will be dismissed to go with Miss Heather, and they're practicing. Pray for them. This is uh, one of their last practices, so keep them in your prayers. All right. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. going to finish up chapter 2 today. We're going to be looking at 24, 25, and 26. There's Bible study sheets on the back table if you'd like to have one. Obviously not necessary. But what we're looking at is Solomon's view of life under the sun. Does anybody remember what that phrase under the sun means? The earthly life doesn't take into consideration God. And uh, men can have a lot of things, but if you don't have God, uh, things don't really matter that much. It's kind of interesting. Solomon has been dealing with the vanities of life. We saw him talk about the following things, the vanities of labor and work, of worldly wisdom, uh, of preparing for the future. And uh, really, it's interesting when you look, look at uh, verse 13 of chapter 1. He said, I gave my heart to seek and to search out wisdom concerning all the things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. God is mentioned in verse 13. And then the next time we see that God's mentioned is in chapter 2, verse 24. Solomon has been talking about a view of life without God. And it's obvious because God's not mentioned. Now he really comes to his first conclusion of the book in verses 24, 25, and 26 of chapter 2. And that's what I want us to look at tonight. 
Let's notice what he says. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat, drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who else can hasten hitherto more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom, knowledge, joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give it to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of the spirit. I've entitled the lesson tonight, Accept the Life that God has Given You. A lot of times people don't accept what they have. A lot of people don't see what they have. They think about what they don't have and they miss out on what God has given them. After these three verses, we'll have completed the first section of the book of Ecclesiastes, chapters 1 and 2. The problem that Solomon discerned, Solomon gave us arguments that showed life was not worth living. That was his premise. He said in chapter 1, verses 4 through 11, we consider the monotony of life. We do a lot of the same things every day. And that bothered Solomon. And then in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, he, we calculated the vanity of wisdom. What's the benefit of wisdom? The wise man dies and so does the fool. Yeah. Both of them are going to... And so Solomon tried to puzzle that out and considered it. And then we saw, we contemplated the futility of wealth, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Man lays up, doesn't know who he's going to leave it to, whether the man will be a fool or a wise man. And uh, that bothered Solomon. But once again, he's looking at life under the sun. He's considering it from a human perspective. And then we conversed about the certainty of death, chapter 2, verses 12 through 23. Now Solomon's arguments seemed to be cruel, crushing, and depressing. And I hesitated to teach on the book of Ecclesiastes. Nevertheless, it's important for us as Christians to learn we're not to live our lives under the sun. We're not to be sucked in the to the way that the world lives. The world thinks that money will bring them happiness. Uh, the world thinks that uh, uh, fame uh, will give them a feeling of, a, of accomplishment. And what they find out is that those things don't satisfy. Everything that's important about life is in God's hands. He's necessary if we're going to enjoy what we have in life. The world likes to cut God out, you know. Uh, you invite somebody to church, I worship up on the mountain. I, I want to be, well, I'm not saying you can't worship on the mountain, but God said not to forsake the assembling of yourself together, that you're to be with other believers and you're to worship together. But people cut God out of their lives, and they... They try to find satisfaction, they try to find joy, they try to find peace, and then when they can't find it, they're mad at God. And Solomon is dealing with this because Solomon tried everything there was to try. Um, it's interesting to note that, as I said before, God is not mentioned from verse 14 in chapter 1 till verse 23 in chapter 2. Why? Why? Because Solomon wasn't considering God in the things that life had brought him. And now the whole, ter uh, the whole uh, theme changes. His tone changes. Uh, God has to be involved in our lives. God is the reason and the purpose of our lives. Everything that is important in life is in God's hands. He's necessary if we're going to enjoy the life he's given us. This is the first of six conclusions that Solomon is going to draw in the book. If you want to enjoy life, 
till its fullest, you must recognize God in your life. You can't just give God lip service. You can't just come to church on Sunday and tip your hat at God. No, God has to be an integral part of every day of your life. When you get up, you, you need to hear from him. That's why you need to be in his word. You need to talk to him. You need to be still before him. And you need to learn to enjoy the blessings that he's given to you. In the next eight chapters of this book, Solomon will refute the four arguments that he's made in the two chapters why life is not worth living. He's going to deal with all of these things and we're going to see how it is worth living. He seems to be a little double-minded, but he isn't. Rather, he's simply showing us the difference of a life that's lived with God and one that's just lived with things. And the former is much better than the latter. The latter will never uh, satisfy if you don't have God intricately involved in every part of your life. Now, let's consider this first conclusion that Solomon makes here in verses uh, uh, 24, 25, and 26. Let's read it again. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. Number one, life is actually a gift from God. There's nothing better for a man that he should eat and drink. Now, at first glance, it seems like uh, Solomon is being a fatalist. Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. He's not. He's telling us that the pleasures of life come from God and they're only, they only reach their full potential when you and I share them with the Lord. Uh, verse 24 must be considered in the light of the next two verses. Solomon is not saying that uh, we just eat and drink and then we die. No, he's saying that life is a gift from God. Now, notice two thoughts. A, from God's hand. Solomon is saying that everything we have is from God. Sometimes it takes us a while to learn that. When we're young and before we're saved, we may think we've got everything that we need. We've got the abilities that we need. Uh, we've got the brains that we need. We have the strength that we need. And uh, as we grow older, we realize that all those things that we thought we had in youth are very fleeting. They don't last long. We better realize that God gives us what he wants us to have. Here's the way James put it. Every good and perfect gift is from above. It cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Oh, when we learn that. When we really learn that. That what we have is not a chance of fate. What we have is not something that we earn by our great intelligence or our great strength or our great experience, but that God gave it to us. The capacity to enjoy those things just goes up. I'd like to go beyond what James said by adding that everything that comes into our lives comes from God. I like to say, nothing ever touches our lives that hasn't first passed through nail-pierced hands. God knows. Now, sometimes we don't understand. I get that. We have finite understanding and comprehension. And sometimes some of the things that happen in life, we, we don't understand why God allowed that to happen in our life. But as we learn to trust God, we learn that there are no accidents in our lives. God's appointing the things that come into our life, and they're there for a reason and a, pur a purpose. God's sovereign. God could stop anything, and sometimes we get upset with God because he doesn't stop things. 
something happens to somebody we love or some bad thing happens uh, to our family and we get upset and, and all we can see is just a, a little bit right in front of us. God sees the whole picture. You never know, sometimes the greatest disappointments in your life as you trust God through those difficulties and those hardships, unsaved people are watching and sometimes that's the key for them to come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Unsaved people can understand why you rejoice when you're on the mountaintop. Unsaved people don't know why you rejoice when you're going through a trial because that's foreign to them. And yet the believer believes that God is sovereign. He's in control of what we face. God means it for our good and our glory, uh, His glory, but we don't get that until we grow to the point that we trust Him. And it's not always easy to trust God because sometimes bad things happen. We'd like to think that life is like a book organized into chapters and paragraphs. But can I tell you this? Life is just plain old messy sometimes. I mean, sometimes it just doesn't work the way we think it's going to work. And it doesn't, it doesn't happen and things don't, we don't always understand at the moment that it happens why it's happening. But God does. But the peace comes when we learn to trust Him. When we say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. But I know what your word says and I know that you're in charge and you're in control. What Solomon is saying here is that instead of looking at what we don't have, we should enjoy what God gives us. And God gives us so much. I mean, how many of you were able to get up this morning? How many of you had food to eat for breakfast? How many had the digestion to enjoy the food for <laughs> breakfast? I mean, sometimes we forget about the, all the good that God gives to us every day. And, and we just take it for granted. And that's what Solomon is, is answering here. That's what his conclusion is. How do you handle the things in life that you don't understand? So from God's hand, but be to your mouth. To your mouth. There are so many blessings in the life of the believer that it's easy to begin to take them for granted. Solomon said there's nothing better for a man that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This I also saw was from the hand of God. The Bible tells us in everything give thanks because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. Now, I'll readily admit there are some things that are easier to give thanks for than other things. But if we really believe God knows what he's doing and that God is at work in our lives, we will enjoy what he gives to us. It's God who gives us all that we need as his children, but it's us who receive it. We're the recipients of God's goodness and grace Every day. It's easy for us in the busyness of life to forget all the benefits that God has provided for us. All the blessings that he's given us. I'm 66 years old and I've never been hungry one day in my life unless I decided to go on a diet. That's the only time I've ever really experienced hunger, you know. And that's not really hunger because, you know, when Karen's not looking, I can sneak something, you know. <laughs> yeah. Say, you may sneak it, but everybody sees it, Pastor. Uh, <laughs> understand all the things that God's done for us. Do you realize what it means to, to live 66 years? Not everybody does. Not everybody makes it out of their childhood. Not everybody makes it out of their teenage years. Those are dangerous years. Not everybody makes it through middle age. 
God's been good to us. And it's so easy to take it for granted. And what Solomon is saying here is that you need to realize that God has taken care of you. There may have been times where you didn't know where it was going to come from, and yet God didn't fail you. He took care of you. There may have been times you didn't understand why you were going through what you were going through, but God was the constant in your life. He was that stabilizing effect for everything that you were facing. The scripture tells us, Paul said, having food and rain, let us therewith be content. Most of us have had a lot more than food and raiment. Are you content? Paul also said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Philippians 4.11, he goes on to say, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed to be full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. Oh, that we could get to the point that we realize that God gives us exactly what we need to learn what we need to learn at that point in our life. And it's not about things, it's about God. It's about knowing Him. It's about enjoying Him and enjoying His blessings. You know, I've often wondered, when an atheist is thankful, who do they thank? I, I mean, and yet some Christians, don't we live like practical atheists? Don't we focus on what we don't have instead of thanking God for what we do have? If the Lord's taken care of you all these years since you've been saved, doesn't mean that it's always been easy. But if he's taken care of you, don't you think he's done a pretty good job to bring you to where you're at? Um, you know, if he doesn't take care of you, you'll be the first one of his youngins that he neglected. It won't happen, folks. Solomon was able to recognize God's goodness and his provision in his life. When he's trying to convince himself that life is not worth living, and he runs through all these problems and, and why it's not worth living, he finally comes to this first conclusion and said, you know, God's given me everything I have, and I need to be thankful, and I need to praise him. And when we're thankful, that's when those things begin to bring some contentment and some joy. So don't lose your thankfulness. Don't miss out on all that the Lord does for you. But there's a second thought here. In the second Roman numeral, life is to be accepted with gratitude to God. There's a second thought that Solomon included in verse 24 and 25. Look what he says. That he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This I also saw that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who else can hasten hitherto more than I? You see, God not only gives us the things that we have, but God gives us the ability to enjoy the things that we have. You know, there's a lot of wealthy people that have a lot more things than what we have. That doesn't necessarily mean that they enjoy them. And we, we see that millionaires commit suicide. Billionaires commit suicide. What happens? What, what, why? Why do people choose that? Blessings that God gives and the ability to enjoy them. Later on, Solomon will tell us, that if we do not enjoy the blessings that God gives, that that's evil. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 5 of Ecclesiastes, we'll see that. Now, we know this. The Jewish people read the book of Ecclesiastes during the Feast of Tabernacles. This was because Tabernacles is a time of feasting and thanksgiving and rejoicing. And this book reminds us that God is the one who's given us what we have. 
and that to fully enjoy it, we need to be in a right relationship with God. Um, a, who has it better than us? Now, I've been a Rams fan since I was a little boy. Um, I grew up in the vicinity of Chicago, and so when we got two football games on Sundays when I was a little boy, our second game would be a West Coast game. So I got to see the Rams play a lot. And I liked Roman Gabriel and Jack Snow and Les Josephson and Deacon Jones and Merlin Olson. And uh, if there's one thing that a Rams fan doesn't like, it's the 40 whiners. Okay? No real Ram fan likes a 49. Now, I pastored for 19 years in the Bay Area where everybody wants to re wear red and gold, okay? But there was a coach there named Jim Harbaugh a while back, and I remember when he was coaching the 49ers, after, they, after every game, he would ask them, who has it better than us? And I, I thought, why is he saying that? After every game, because, you know, I had to see the 40 whiners all the time because that was on, what was on. And the team would answer back, no one. And the more I thought about it, the more I, I understood what he was trying to teach that team. He was trying to teach them gratitude. You know, if America has lost anything in the last... 40 or 50 years, it's our attitude of gratitude. So many people today expect everything to be given to them, everything to be done for them. And you know what? That may sound good and that might get the politicians reelected, but let me tell you something. The things that you work for are the things that you really enjoy. And when you realize that everything you have, God's given it to you, it gives you a sense of gratitude. And that's what he's trying to say here. I'm so thankful that my dad taught me as a little boy that nobody owes me anything, but I owe God everything. I remember my mom telling me when I was probably five, six, seven, she said, Son, I hope you'll work. And she said, there are so many husbands that they won't work. And I don't want you to be like that. I mean, I wanted to get a lunch pail at four, you know, to punch in, you know. Nobody owes us anything. God's given us a lot more than what we deserve. And people who walk around thinking that people owe them something, they're never going to be happy. They're never going to have any joy. They're living under the sun, folks. It is gratitude to God that really gives us the grace to get through life. Solomon wanted his readers to understand that even though life is not always fair, God is always good. Life isn't fair. I mean, I, I read story after story. I, I read a story about uh, Ed Thompson. Uh, he uh, became, uh, joined the army. Uh, he uh, became a Green Beret. And uh, he, in, in uh, the early 60s, he was sent to a little country he had never heard of, Vietnam. And he was in a little Cessna plane with a pilot. And the plane was shot down. The pilot was killed. He was the first casualty in the Vietnam War. And Thompson was the first POW. And he spent a majority of his life. And I, I, I think eight, ten years in a POW camp. Life isn't always fair. Life would have been a lot better if sin hadn't come into the world. If Adam and Eve would have chosen 
wisely. But folks, life isn't always fair. You may not always like what God allows to come into your life, but God's always good. God means it for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are the called according to his purpose. You say, how is that? I don't know. That's where faith comes in. He goes on to say in the next verse that he's predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son. And I imagine that we need some of those dark times and those difficult times as well as those times of blessing for him to mold us and to make us like Jesus Christ, his son. Roger and I were talking today a, a, a little bit about what it's going to be like when we see the Lord and the things that we learn and the, we learn to appreciate. Folks, do you understand what it's going to be like when we get to heaven and we don't have to put up with death anymore? We don't have to put up with sickness and old age and joints that hurt and things that don't work right. We don't have to worry about income tax and filling out government forms. I don't know about you, but I, I'm looking forward to that. But you know what? We learn that God is good down here in the midst of the trial. We learn that his peace can be ours. We learn that he gives to us what he wants us to have, and not just what he wants us to have, but what he wants us to enjoy. There's nothing inherent in the human heart that makes it possible for us to extract enjoyment and blessing out of what we do. I know people who've seemingly done things for other people. But I found out later on they did it for themselves because they got mad because somebody didn't notice what they had done. The joy comes when we do it because we love the Lord and we want to be a blessing to someone. And you have to learn that. That doesn't come natural to, to us. I'll tell you what comes natural to us. I learned it the first day of school at the water fountain. Me first, you second. None of us have to be taught that. That's there. Okay? Sometimes it shocks me what's there. Sometimes it shocks me how selfish I can be. Sometimes God lets me see those things. And sometimes those things are seen as we go through trouble and trials and burdens. If you develop an attitude of you owe me, buckle up because life's going to be rough. You're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to, you're going to think that God's not fair to you. You see, we don't, God doesn't owe us anything. Matter of fact, if God never did anything else for me the rest of my life, I couldn't pay him for what he's already done for me. So we need to realize that. And then the second thought, let us be thankful for what we have. Perhaps you think if you had millions, you'd be happy. Or maybe a new car or a better house or a better job. You would find that elusive thing called happiness, but really no such luck. There's nothing in you or in your children that will bring you happiness, peace, contentment. If you try everything that Solomon tried, you know what you're going to find out? If you don't include God in it, it's going to be vanity and vexation of spirit. You can't cut God out of it and have any enjoyment, any peace, any contentment. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. It's all vanity of vanities, vexation of spirit. Those who think if they got the uh, 10000 a week from Publishers Clearinghouse that everything would be okay. No, you know what? You would have relatives coming out of the woodwork you didn't even know you had. You would. And you would have problems. But if you enjoy what God's given you this week, and praise him for it, and use it to try to honor him and be a blessing to somebody, it's an amazing thing that God does. Joy comes with it. 
<clears throat> Most of you know the name uh, John, David Rock, uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller. He founded Standard Oil of Pennsylvania. He worked very hard. And uh, he started out and uh, uh, he, he made a million. And then he was, at one point in time, he was making a million a week. And by the time he was about 45, he, he couldn't eat. His stomach was always upset. The doctors had him on a, like a milk diet and a little bite of this and a little bite of that. And he decided his mother had taught him to tithe when he was a little boy, and he started living differently. He started trying to help other people. They thought he was going to die before he was 50. He lived till he was 98, <laughs> you know. But his whole life changed because of thankfulness and gratitude. And using what God gives you, here's what he said. He said, I've made millions, but they have brought me no happiness. I would barter all of them for the days I sat on an office stool in Cleveland and counting myself rich at $3 a week. You know, there was a day most of us dreamed of making what we're not making it on now. Folks, learn to be grateful. You say, okay, if things don't bring me happiness, joy, how do I get them? Look at verse 25 and you'll see the implication. For who can eat or who else can hasten hitherto unto more than I? You know what Solomon is saying? He's asking this question. Who can enjoy things more than me? If the Lord Jesus is in the middle of your blessing, if he's real to you, you spend time with him. You do what you do because you love him. The, the byproduct is, is that you have joy and contentment. And that's what Solomon is trying to say there in verse 25. Who else can do that but me? Wise was the farmer that prayed, thanks for the food that we have to eat and the good digestion to enjoy it. Solomon made more than anybody in his day and yet he realized that joy didn't come from stuff. You won't enjoy stuff either unless the Lord allows it, unless you share it with the Lord, unless you're thankful. Solomon has and is learning that if he wanted to fully enjoy, then he must keep the Lord at the center of his life. I know you think, Pastor, this is so simple, but it's so easy let the Lord slip out of the center of our life. And you know how we can tell? He slipped out of the center of our lives. We begin to complain. We begin to find fault. We begin to commiserate. We begin to count our bruises instead of counting our blessings. Let's keep him in the very center of our life. Let's enjoy what he's given us and let's be thankful to him thought tonight. Number three, life is to be achieved with grace from God. Look at our last verse. For God giveth to a man in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the travail, to gather and to heap up but to him that is good for God, this vanity and vexation of, uh, of spirit. Now this last statement is a statement that reminds us that everything we achieve, we achieve with God's grace. God makes a difference between those who love him and those that don't. Laws and principles that God sets down in his word are not just God trying to prove to us he's God. He knows he's God. They're principles that he's trying to teach us so that we'll live the abundant life. We'll get the most out of life. The principles that God sets down in his word enables a man to fully enjoy what God's given him. 
a lack of character will rob the man who ignores God. You see, it's not enough to possess things. You must also possess the kind of character that allows us to use things in a way that God wants us to use them. That takes character, and that takes growing and learning what God wants us to be. The principles that God lays down in his word are there to lead us to that abundant life. It's not easy when you're little to learn to give. The most natural thing is to want. Give me, give me, give me. But as you grow and you learn that God has given to you and he, he's given extra, it's to be a blessing to someone. And maybe it's not material things. Maybe it's just your time or maybe it's a kind word or an encouragement or a note to someone. You see... It's not a, enough to possess things. You have to possess the character to be able to enjoy those things. I watch a lot of people that get money. They win the lottery or they get a big inheritance. And a lot of them can't handle it. A lot of them wind up, a lot of lottery winners in 18 months to two, three years, they wind up being poor more poor than they were before. Why? Because they never learned how to make money or how to use money. And they think that if they just get it, everything will, and, and everything just goes to pot. They buy everything and everything they don't need, and, and they find out the more that you buy, the more can tear up. And the truth is, we didn't bring anything into this world and guess how much we're going to be taken out yeah. no not a one and yet if we enjoy what God's given us on a daily basis how much richer are we than about 95% of the world's population just enjoying what God has done we need that character, and a lot of the things that God teaches us, a lot of the hardships that we go through is that God is developing the image of his son in us. He's predestinating us to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what he wants. A, what God gives to the good man. God delights to give to the, to the good man, a man that lives according to God's word. Our verse said God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. That's more than material blessings. Those are things that people can't take away. It does pay to live right. It doesn't mean that your life will always be easy. It doesn't mean that you'll always understand the trials that God allows you to go through. But if God gives you wisdom and joy and 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 you can enjoy what God's given you, you're really rich. You're richer than about nine-tenths of the world, folks. And that's what he's, he's saying here. Uh, there's many people who possess great wealth, but that doesn't mean they live happy lives. Say, well, man, I'd sure like to give it a shot. Well, Solomon gave it a shot. And that's what he's telling us. God gives us something more valuable than wealth he gives us wisdom to know how to enjoy it to help other people to understand our place before God and to develop the capacity to truly enjoy life how many of you have gotten up early and seen a beautiful sunrise and just sat there for a minute and said thank you Lord that was more beautiful than any artist could ever paint or how many of you have heard a, a bird singing in the distance and they, they live out in the elements, they have a little nest made out of twig, but they're, they're singing the most beautiful song. And you think, God made them and gave them that and they're fulfilling the purpose that God has and not a sparrow falls to the ground that the Lord doesn't know. You see, Solomon tried all the superficial things. 
And Solomon started off as a good man. And he made some mistakes. And he got his eyes off the giver and got them on the gifts. And he had to learn the hard way what he wants us to learn through his example. So I'm asking you, are you appreciating your blessing? When you pray, do you spend as much time thanking the Lord as asking the Lord for things? Many look at what they don't have and they rob themselves of the blessings they do have. They forget to count their blessing. And then what God gathers from the bad man. Our text says God tells us that many times bad men lay up all this wealth, but God gives it to somebody else. I want to tell you about a building down in Colorado Springs, a place called the Glen Erie Estate. Today it's a conference center. It's owned by the Navigators. The Navigators were a group of men. Uh, the most famous one was a man by the name of Dawson Trotman. And they wanted to reach sailors with the gospel. The Navigators had one of the best Bible memorization programs that ever been put out. Well, the Bible, the, this building is owned by the Navigators today, but originally it was built by a wealthy man for his wife. And yet shortly after moving in that magnificent mansion, his wife said, who needs this? After all, what are you going to do with 35 rooms? I know what my wife's going to do. When the relatives come, I'm going to be busy cleaning all them rooms. <laughs> yeah. And so he sold it, and, and the navigators bought it for a reduced price. But you know what they use it today? They use it as a conference center. They use it to teach people about the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, a lot of times, um, God looks like he's blessing bad men, but folks, the reason we think that is we take the short view of life. You know, God can wait a generation or two. You know, we're very limited. God knows exactly what he's doing. And Solomon is learning that when it looks like the bad man is prospering, no, he's just holding on to those things until God can give it to who he wants to give it to. The Egyptians grew wealthy on the backs of Jewish slavery. But when God took the Jewish people out of Egypt. He took the wealth of Egypt with him. God knows what he's doing. Sometimes we see and we think, man, why, why is God blessing that evil man? Well, maybe he's just laying up for a good man down the road. God knows what he's doing. Just trust him. You just be thankful for the things that he's given to you. They're unique to you. Any questions or comments over what his first conclusion is? Life is worth living. At first he said it wasn't, but he concluded, if you enjoy what God's given you with God, it's worth living. If you don't, it's vanity and vexation of spirit. So go home and enjoy what God's given you tonight. <laughs> Let's look to the Lord in word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this book, and Lord, I puzzle over it. I, I think about it, and I try to understand it, and I'm not sure that I've got all the answers yet, Lord, but I'm learning, and I'm learning that the good things in life are good because I can enjoy them with you, and I can be thankful to you. Thank you for the health that I have, and thank you for the warm home that I'm going to sleep in tonight, and Thank you for the food that I'm going to eat tomorrow morning when I get up. Lord, thank you for being so good to me. But most of all, thank, thank you for your son who died on the cross for me. And Lord, when it comes time to leave this world, it's not going to be hard because I'm going to go, come home to be with you and be with your son, the Lord Jesus. 
Lord, be with Frank tonight. Lord, he's so tired and so weak. Lord, we know your timing will be perfect, but give him grace until you call him home. And then, Lord, I pray for Miss Lois. Be with her, Lord. Lord, uh, give her a peace in her heart that only you can do. Lord, you can even control those thoughts that jump into her mind and those fears that she have. I just pray that you'd give her peace and give Pastor wisdom as he ministers to Miss Lois and give him the grace and strength that he needs. Lord, help us to be thankful with what you've given. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.